Part two, chapter three of En Route by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Charles Keegan Paul. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. He woke with a bound at eleven o'clock with an impression of someone looking at him in his sleep. Lighting a match, he ascertained the time and seeing no one, fell back in bed again and slept at a stretch till four o'clock. Then he dressed himself in haste and ran to the church. The vestibule, which had been dark on the previous evening, was lit up that morning, for an old monk was celebrating mass at the altar of St. Joseph. He was bald and infirm, with a white beard waving from side to side in long threads with every gust of wind. A lay brother was assisting him, a small man with black hair and a shaven head, like a ball painted blue. He looked like a bandit, with his beard in disorder and his worn-out robe of felt and the eyes of this bandit were gentle and startled like those of a little boy. He served the priest with an almost timid respect and a suppressed joy which was touching to see. Others, kneeling on the flagstones, prayed with concentrated attention or read their mass. Durtal noticed the old man of eighty, immovable with outstretched face and closed eyes, and the youth whose look of pity had helped him near the pond was following the office in his prayer-book with attentive meditation. He looked about twenty years old, tall and strong. His face, with an air of fatigue, was at once masculine and tender, with emaciated features and a light beard which fell over his habit in a point. Durtal gave way to his emotions in this chapel, where every one did a little to help him, and thinking of the confession he was about to make, he implored the Saviour to help him, and prayed that the monk would completely explore his soul and he felt himself less dismayed more master of himself and firmer he collected and pulled himself together feeling a melancholy confusion but he had no longer the sense of desolation which had overcome him the evening before he set his mind on the idea that he would not abandon himself that he would help himself with all his might and that in any case he could not collect himself better these reflections were interrupted by the departure of the old trappist who had finished offering the sacrifice and by the entry of the prior who went up in the rotunda between two white fathers to say mass at the high altar durtal was absorbed in his prayer-book but he ceased reading when the priest had consumed the species for all rose and he was amazed at a sight of which he had never dreamed a communion of monks they advanced in single file silent and with downcast eyes and when the first arrived before the altar he turned round to embrace the comrade who followed he in turn took in his arms the religious who followed him and so on to the last all before receiving the eucharist exchanged the kiss of peace then they knelt communicated and came back in single file turning into the rotunda behind the altar and the return was unexpected with the white fathers at the head of the line they made their way very slowly with closed eyes and joined hands the faces seemed to be somewhat altered they were differently lit from within it seemed that the soul, driven by the power of the sacrament against the sides of the body, filtered through the pores and lit up the skin with a special light of joy, with that kind of brightness which pours from white souls, and makes way like a rose-coloured vapour along the cheeks, and shines as if concentrated on the brow. Watching the mechanical and hesitating gait of these monks, it seemed as if their bodies were no more than automata moving from habit, and that the souls, being elsewhere, gave no heed to them durtal recognized the old lay brother bent so much that his face disappeared in his beard which pressed against his chest and his two great knotty hands trembled as he clasped them he also noticed the tall young brother his features seeming drawn on a dissolved surface gliding with short steps his eyes closed by a fatal chance he thought upon himself he was the only one who did not communicate for he saw Monsieur Bruneau coming last from behind the altar and returning to his place with folded arms. This exclusion brought home to him clearly how different he was, and how far apart from those around him. All were admitted, and he alone remained outside. His unworthiness was more apparent, and he grew sad at being put aside, looked on, as he deserved to be, as a stranger, separated like the goat of the scriptures, penned far from the sheep, on the left of christ these reflections were of use to him for they relieved him of the terror of confession which was again coming over him this act seemed to him so natural and just in his necessary humiliation and unavoidable suffering 
that a desire came over him to accomplish it at once so that he might appear in this chapel purified and washed and with at least some resemblance to the others when the mass was over he made his way towards his cell to get a tablet of chocolate at the top of the stairs monsieur bruno with a large apron round him was getting ready to clean the steps durtal looked on him with surprise the oblate smiled and shook hands with him this is an excellent task for the soul he said showing his broom it recalls modest sentiments which one is too inclined to forget after living in the world and he began sweeping vigorously and collecting into a pan the dust which like pepper filled every crevice in the floor durtal carried his tablet into the garden let us consider he said to himself as he nibbled it supposing i took another walk and tried an unknown part of the wood and he felt no wish to do so no placed as i am i would rather haunt the same spot and not leave the places to which i am accustomed i am already so little under control and so easily disturbed that i do not wish to risk anything by curiosity to see new places and he went down to the cross pond he went along the banks and having reached the end was astonished to find a few steps farther a stream spotted with green pellicules hollowing its way between two hedges which fenced in the monastery the fields stretched out beyond and the roofs of a large farmhouse were visible in the trees and all round the horizon on hills were forests which seemed to stop the way before the sky i imagined the grounds were larger he said to himself retracing his steps and having reached the end of the cross pond he gazed on the huge wooden crucifix reared in the air which was reflected in that black mirror it sank down seen from behind trembling in the small waves stirred up by the breeze and seemed to fall whirling round in that stretch of ink and as the body of the marble christ was hidden by the wood only the two white arms which hung below the tree could be seen twisting in the blackness of the water seated on the grass durtal gazed on the hazy image of the recumbent cross and thinking of his soul which like the pond was tanned and stained by a bed of dead leaves and a dunghill of sins he pitied the saviour whom he was about to invite to bathe himself there for it would no longer be the martyr of golgotha to whom at all events death came on a hill his head high by daylight in the open air but it would be by an increase of outrages the abominable plunging of the crucified body the head low by night into a depth of mud ah oh, it would be time to spare him in filtering and clarifying me he cried to himself and the swan till then motionless in an arm of the pond swept over the lamentable image in advancing and whitened the moving morning of the waters with its peaceful reflection and durtal thought of the absolution which he would perhaps obtain and he reopened his prayer-book and numbered his faults and slowly as on the day before he tapped in his innermost being a fountain of tears i must control myself he said trembling at the idea that he would suffocate again and be unable to speak and he resolved to begin his confession at the other end first going over the minor sins keeping the great ones for the end so as to finish with the avowal of his carnal misdeeds if i succumb then i can explain myself in two words my god may the prior only not remain silent as he did yesterday may he only absolve me he shook off his sadness left the pond and returning to the lime avenue he interested himself in a closer inspection of the trees they raised huge trunks covered with reddish-brown stone crop silvered grey by mosses and several that morning were wrapped as in a mantle trimmed with pearls gossamer threads studded with drops of dew he sat down on a bench but fearing a shower for it looked threatening he retired to his cell he felt no desire to read he was eager for while yet he dreaded the arrival of nine o'clock to have done with to get rid of the weight upon his soul and he prayed mechanically without knowing what he mumbled always thinking on this confession full of alarm and harassed with fears he went down a little before the time and when he entered the auditorium his heart failed him in spite of himself his eyes were fixed upon the prie dieu where he had suffered so cruelly to think that he had put himself on that hurdle again to stretch himself on that rack of torture he tried to collect himself to compose himself and he drew himself up quickly he heard the footsteps of the monk the door opened and for the first time durtal dared to look the prior in the face it seemed to be hardly the same man nor the face he had noticed from a distance the profile was so haughty and the full face so sweet 
the eye dulls the proud energy of the features an eye familiar and deep when at the same time there was a quiet joy and a sad pity come he said do not be disturbed you are about to speak to our saviour alone who knows all your faults and he knelt down and prayed for some time and came as on the day before to sit by the prie dieu he bent towards durtal and listened somewhat reassured the penitent began without too great anguish he accused himself of faults common to all men want of charity towards his neighbour evil speaking hate rash judgment abuse lies vanity anger etc the monk interrupted him for a moment you said just now i think that in your youth you contracted debts have you paid them and on an affirmative sign from durtal he said good and went on have you belonged to any secret society have you fought a duel i am obliged to ask these questions for they are reserved cases no good and he was silent before god i accuse myself of everything resumed durtal as i confessed to you yesterday since my first communion i have given up everything prayers mass everything i have denied god i have blasphemed I had entirely lost faith and durtal stopped he was reaching the sins of the flesh his voice fell here i do not know how to explain myself he said keeping back his tears let us see the monk said gently you told me yesterday that you had committed all those acts which are comprised in the sin of lust yes father and trembling he added must i go into the details no it is useless i will confine myself to asking you for it alters the nature of the sin whether in your case there have been any private sins or any sins committed between persons of the same sex not since i left school have you committed adultery yes am i to understand that in your relations with women you have committed every possible excess durtal made an affirmative sign that is sufficient and the monk was silent durtal choked with disgust the avowal of these horrors was a terrible effort to him yet crushed as he was by shame he was beginning to breathe when suddenly he plunged his head again in his hands the remembrance of the sacrilege in which madame chantelouve had made him share came back to him hesitatingly he confessed that he had from curiosity assisted at a black mass and that afterwards without wishing it he had defiled a host which that woman saturated with satanism concealed about her the prior listened without moving did you continue your visits to that woman no that had given me a horror of her the trappist reflected and said that is all i think i have confessed everything replied durtal the confessor was silent for some minutes and then in a pensive voice he murmured i am struck even more than yesterday by the astonishing miracle which heaven has worked in you you were sick so sick that what martha said of the body of lazarus might truly have been said of your soul yam fetit and christ has in some manner raised you only do not deceive yourself the conversion of a sinner is not his cure but only his convalescence and this convalescence sometimes lasts for several years and is often long it is expedient that you should determine from this moment to fortify yourself against any falling back and to do all in your power for recovery the preventive treatment consists of prayer the sacrament of penance and holy communion prayer you know it for without much prayer you could not have decided to come here after the troubled life you have led ah oh, but i prayed so badly it does not matter as your wish was to pray well confession it was painful to you it will be less so now that you no longer have to avow the accumulated sins of years the communion troubles me more for it is to be feared that when you have triumphed over the flesh the demon should await you there and endeavour to draw you away for he knows well that without this divine government no healing is possible you will therefore have to give this matter all your attention 
the monk reflected for a minute and then went on the holy eucharist you will have more need of it than others for you will be more unhappy than less cultured and simpler beings you will be tortured by the imagination it has made you sin much and by a just recompense it will make you suffer much it will be the badly closed door of your soul by which the demon will enter and spread himself in you watch over this and pray fervently that the saviour may help you tell me have you a rosary no father i feel said the monk that the tone in which you said no shows a certain hostility to the rosary i admit that this mechanical manner of saying prayers wearies me a little i do not know why but it seems to me that at the end of some seconds i can no longer think of what i am saying i should mock and should certainly end by stammering out something stupid you have known quietly answered the prior some fathers of families their children stammer forth caresses and tell them no matter what and yet they are delighted to listen why should not our lord who is a good father love to hear his children when they drawl or even when they talk nonsense and after a pause he went on i sent the devil's artifice in what you say for the highest graces are attached to this crown of prayers the most blessed virgin herself revealed to the saints this means of prayer she declared she delighted in it that should be enough to make us love it do it then for her who has powerfully assisted in your conversion who has interceded with her son to save you remember also that god wished that all graces should come to us through her saint bernard expressly declares totum nos habere voluit per mariam the monk paused anew and added however the rosary enrages fools and that is a sure sign you will for a penance recite ten every day for a month he ceased and then went on again slowly all of us alas retain that scar of original sin which is the inclination towards evil each man encourages it more or less as for you since you grew up the scar has been always open but as you hate the wound god will close it so i will say nothing of your past as your repentance and your firm resolve to sin no more efface it to-morrow you will receive the pledge of reconciliation you will communicate after so many years the lord will set out on the way to your soul and will rest there approach him with great humility and prepare yourself from this moment by prayer for this mysterious meeting of hearts which his goodness desires now say your act of contrition and i will give you holy absolution the monk raised his arms and the sleeves of his white cowl rose above him like two wings with uplifted eyes he uttered the imperious formula which breaks the bonds and the three words ego te absolvo spoken more distinctly and slowly fell upon durtal who trembled from head to foot he almost sank to the ground incapable of collecting himself or understanding himself only feeling in the clearest manner that christ himself was present near him in that place and finding no word of thanks he wept ravished and bowed down under the great sign of the cross with which the monk enveloped him he seemed to be waking from a dream as the prior said to him rejoice your life is dead it is buried in a cloister and in a cloister it will be born again it is a good omen have confidence in our lord and go in peace and the father added pressing his hand do not be afraid of disturbing me i am entirely at your service not only for confession but for interviews and for any advice which may be of use to you you quite understand me they left the auditorium together the monk bowed to him in the corridor and disappeared durtal hesitated whether to meditate in his cell or in the church when monsieur bruno met him approaching durtal he said well that is a fine weight the less on your stomach and as durtal looked at him in astonishment he laughed do you think that an old sinner like me could not tell from a thousand nothings if only from the way your poor eyes are now shining that you had not been reconciled when you landed here now i have just met the reverend father returning to the cloister and i find you coming out of the auditorium there is no need to be particularly sly to guess that the great wash has just taken place but said durtal you could not have seen the prior with me for he had left before you came in and he might have been performing some other duty no for he was not in his scapular he had his cowl on 
and as he never puts on that robe except to go to church or at confessions i was quite certain that he came from the auditorium as there is no office at this hour i may also point out that as the trappists do not come to confession in this room two persons only could have been with him you or i you may say as much replied durtal laughing father etienne met them in the midst of all this and durtal asked him for a rosary but i have not one exclaimed the monk i have several said monsieur bruno and shall be most happy to offer you one you will allow me father the monk acquiesced by a sign then if you will come with me replied the oblate addressing durtal i will hand it you without delay they went upstairs together and durtal then learnt that m bruno lived in a room at the bottom of a small corridor not far from his own his cell was very simply furnished with old middle-class furniture a bed a mahogany bureau a large bookcase full of ascetic books an earthenware stove and some armchairs these articles were evidently the property of the oblate for they were nothing like the furniture of la trappe pray be seated said m bruno indicating an armchair and they conversed having first discussed the sacrament of penance the talk came round to the subject of father maximin and durtal admitted the high bearing of the prior had terrified him at first m bruno laughed yes he said he produces that effect on those who never come near him but when one associates with him one finds that he is only strict for himself for no one is more indulgent to others in every acceptation of the term he is a true and holy monk and besides he has great judgment and as durtal spoke to him of other cenobites and wondered that there were some quite young men among them m bruno replied it is a mistake to suppose that most trappists have lived in the world the idea so widespread that people take refuge in la trappe after long sorrows or disorderly lives is absolutely false besides to be able to stand the weakening rule of the cloister it is necessary to begin young and not to come in worn out with every kind of abuse it is also necessary to avoid confounding misanthropy with the monastic vocation it is not hypochondria but the divine call which leads to la trappe there is a special grace which makes all young men who have never lived in the world long to bury themselves in silence and therein suffer the hardest privations and they are happy as i hope you will be and yet their life is still more rigorous than you would think take the lay brothers for example think of their giving themselves up to the most painful labour and that they have not like the fathers the consolation of singing and assisting at all the offices remember that even their reward the communion is not very often conceded to them now think of the winter here the cold is frightful in these decayed buildings nothing shuts properly and the wind sweeps the house from top to bottom they freeze without fires they sleep upon pallets and they cannot help or encourage each other for they hardly know each other as all conversation is forbidden think also that these poor people never hear a kindly word a word which would soothe and comfort them they work from dawn till night and the master never thanks them for their zeal never tells the good workman that he is pleased consider also that in summer when men are hired from the neighbouring villages to reap the harvest these rest when the sun scorches the fields they sit in their shirt sleeves under the shade of the ricks and drink if they are thirsty and eat and the lay brother in his heavy clothes looks at them and goes on with his work and neither eats nor drinks ah men must have well-tempered souls to stand such a life but surely there must be some off days said durtal when the rule is relaxed never there is not even as in some very strict orders the carmelites to take one instance an hour of recreation when the religious may talk and laugh here the silence is eternal even when they are together in the refectory then they read the conferences of cassien the holy ladder of climacus the lives of the fathers of the desert or some other pious book and on sunday on sunday they rise an hour earlier but on the whole it is their best day for they can follow all the officers and pass their whole time in church humility and self-denial carried to such an extent are superhuman cried durtal but they are surely given a sufficient quantity of strong nourishment to enable them to give themselves up from morning till evening to exhausting work in the fields m bruno smiled they simply get vegetables which are not even as good as those which are served to us and by way of wine they quench their thirst with a sour and insipid liquid which leaves half a glass full of sediment they get a pint each and if they are thirsty they can add water 
and how often do they eat that depends from the fourteenth september to lent they only eat once a day at half past two and during lent this meal is put off till four o'clock from easter to the fourteenth september when the cistercian fast is less strict dinner is at about half past eleven and to this may be added a light meal in the evening it is frightful to work for months on one meal a day two hours after noon after being up since two o'clock in the morning having had no dinner the evening before it is sometimes necessary to relax the rule a little and when a monk fails from weakness he is not refused a morsel of bread it would be well continued monsieur bruno pensively to relax still further the grasp of these observances for this question of food is becoming a veritable stumbling block in recruiting for la trappe souls which delight in these cloisters are forced to fly them because their bodies cannot stand the rule footnote one the opinion of m bruno has been lately adopted by all the abbeys of the order in a general chapter of la trappe held from the twelfth to the eighteenth september eighteen ninety four in holland at tilburg it was decided that except in seasons of fasting the monks might eat a little in the morning dine at eleven and sup in the evening article one hundred and sixteen of the new constitutions voted by this assembly of the chapter and approved by the holy see is in effect thus conceived diebus quibus non jejunar plura sanctu pascha usque adirus septem bris dominicis per totum annum et omnibus festis sermonis aut feriatis extra quadrigesimam omnes monarchi manea cipiant mixtum hora undecima prandeant et ad seram cenent End of footnote one and the fathers lead the same life as the lay brothers absolutely they set the example they all swallow the same pittance and sleep in the same dormitory on similar beds there is complete equality only the fathers have the advantage of singing the office and obtaining more frequent communions among the lay brothers there are two who have interested me particularly one quite young a tall fair man with a pointed beard the other a very old man quite bent the young one is brother anacletus this young man is a veritable column of prayer and one of the most precious recruits whom heaven has bestowed upon our abbey as for old simeon he is a child of la trappe for he was brought up in an orphanage of the order there you have an extraordinary soul a true saint who already lives absorbed in god we will talk of him at greater length another day for it is time we went down the hour of sext is near wait here is the rosary which i am pleased to offer you allow me to add to it a medal of saint benedict and he made over to durtal a small wooden rosary and the strange circle engraved with cabalistic letters the amulet of saint benedict do you know the meaning of these signs yes i read it once in a pamphlet of don Guéranger. good and by the by when do you communicate to-morrow to-morrow it is impossible why impossible because there will be only a single mass to-morrow that of five o'clock and at that the rule prevents your communicating alone father benedict who usually says an earlier mass went away this morning and will not return for two days there is some mistake but the prior positively declared to me that i should communicate to-morrow exclaimed durtal not all the fathers here then are priests no in fact as to priests there is the abbot who is ill the prior who will offer the sacrifice to-morrow at five o'clock father benedict of whom i spoke to you and another whom you have not seen and who is travelling and then if it had been possible i also should have approached the holy table then if the fathers are not all ordained what difference is there between those who have obtained the priesthood and the simple lay brothers education to be a father a man must have studied must know latin and in a word must not be what the lay brothers are peasants or workmen in any case i shall see the prior and as to the communion to-morrow i will let you know after the office but it is tiresome it is a pity you could not have come up this morning with us durtal made a gesture of regret he went into the chapel dwelling on this misfortune and praying god not to delay his re-entry into grace any longer after sext the oblate came to rejoin him it is just as i thought he said but nevertheless you will be admitted to take the sacrament the father prior has arranged with the curate who dines with us he will say a mass to-morrow morning before leaving and you will then communicate oh groaned durtal this news broke his heart 
that he should have come to la trappe to receive the eucharist from the hands of a priest of passage from a jovial priest such as this man ah oh, no i have confessed to a monk and i wished to receive the communion from a monk he exclaimed it would have been better to wait till father benedict returned but what can i do i could hardly explain to the prior how repugnant this unknown priest is to me and how terribly painful it would be to me after having gone through so much to end by being thus reconciled in a cloister and he complained to god telling him that all the joy he might have felt in being purified and clean at last was now spoilt by this disappointment he arrived at the refectory hanging his head the curate was there already seeing durtal's sad demeanour he charitably tried to cheer him but the jokes he attempted produced the opposite effect durtal smiled in order to be polite but his air was so weary that m bruneau who saw it turned the conversation and monopolized the priest durtal was in a hurry for his dinner to be over he had eaten his egg and was painfully swallowing a warm potato soup made with hot oil which from its appearance might have been mistaken for vaseline but he now cared little about his food he said to himself it is dreadful to carry away an irritating and painful recollection of a first communion and i know it will haunt me for ever i know well enough that from a theological point of view it does not matter whether i am dealing with a priest or a trappist both are but interpreters between god and me but yet i feel very well that it is not at all the same thing for once at least i need a guarantee of certain holiness and how can i have it with an ecclesiastic who hawks about jokes like a bagman he stopped remembering that the abbe gevresin fearing this mistrust had specially sent him to a trappist monastery what a run of ill luck he said to himself he did not even hear the conversation which was going on beside him between the curate and the oblate he struggled with himself all alone as he chewed with his nose in his plate i do not wish to communicate to-morrow he went on and he was shocked he was cowardly and becoming foolish at the last would not the saviour give himself to him all the same he rose from the table stirred by a dull anguish and he wandered in the park and went down the paths as chance led him another idea was now growing in him an idea that heaven was inflicting a trial upon him i want humility he repeated well it is to punish me that i am refused the joy of being sanctified by a monk christ has forgiven me that is much why should he do more by taking note of my preferences and granting my wishes this thought appeased him for a few minutes and reproaching himself for rebelling he accused himself of being unjust towards a priest who after all might be a saint ah enough of that he said i must accept the fact and try for once to be a little humble but i have to recite my rosary he seated himself on the grass and began he had not reached the second bead when misunderstanding again pursued him he began again on the pater and ave and went on thinking no more of the sense of his prayers reflecting what ill luck that the one monk who says mass every day should be away so that i have to go through such a disappointment to-morrow he was silent and had a moment of calm when suddenly a new element of trouble burst upon him he looked at the rosary of which he had told ten beads let me see the prior told me to recite ten every day ten beads or ten rosaries beads he said and almost at the same moment answered rosaries he remained perplexed but that is idiotic he could not have told me to go through the rosary ten times a day that would amount to something like five hundred prayers on end no one could do such a task without losing his wits there is no doubt it is clear he meant ten beads but no for if a confessor gives a penance it must be admitted that he would proportion it to the greatness of the sins and as i have such repugnance for these drops of devotion taken in globules it is natural that he should gorge me with a large dose of the rosary still still it cannot be i should not have even time for it all in paris it is absurd and the idea that he was deceiving himself came intermittently charging back still there must be no haggling in ecclesiastical language ten means ten beads no doubt but i remember very well that after he pronounced the word rosary the father expressed himself thus you will say ten that means ten rosaries for otherwise he would have specified ten of a rosary and so he thrust and parried with himself the father had no need to put the dots on all the eyes if he were using an ordinary phrase known to everyone 
this cavilling about the value of a word is ridiculous he tried to get rid of this torment by appealing to his reason and suddenly there came out some argument which unsettled him he found out that it was through cowardice idleness desire for contradiction and the necessity of rebelling that he did not wish to wind his ten reels of the two interpretations i have chosen the one which would relieve me of all effort and trouble it is really too easy that alone proves that i deceive myself when i try to persuade myself that the prior only ordered me to pick out ten beads then a pater ten aves and a gloria are nothing it is not heavy as a penance and then he answered himself but it is much for you for you cannot even attempt so much without wandering he was turning on himself without advancing a step i have never felt such hesitation he said trying to pull himself together i am not stupid and yet i am fighting against my good sense for it is not a matter of doubt i know it i ought to say ten aves and not one more he remained nonplussed almost frightened at his condition which was new to him and to get out of the difficulty to silence himself he thought of a new idea to conciliate both parties which seemed most concise and which presented at least a provisional solution in any case he reflected i cannot communicate to-morrow if i do not complete my penance to-day in the doubt the wisest course is to yoke myself to the ten rosaries later i shall see if necessary i shall be able to consult the prior it is true that he will think me an idiot if i speak to him of these rosaries so i shall not be able to ask him that but then you see you admit yourself it can only be ten beads he was furious with himself and for silence's sake rushed upon the rosary he might well shut his eyes and try to collect himself it was impossible for him at the end of the second ten to follow his prayers he hesitated forgetting the large beads of the parters losing his way in the small beads of the aves stamping on the ground to check himself he thought of transporting himself in imagination at each dose into one of the chapels of the virgin which he loved to attend in paris at notre dame des victoires at saint sulpice at saint severin but these virgins were not numerous enough for him to dedicate each set of ten to them so he evoked the madonnas of the early masters and absorbed before their images he turned the windlass of his prayers not understanding what he mumbled but praying the mother of the saviour to accept his paternosters as she would receive the lost smoke of a censer forgotten before the altar i cannot force myself any more he said he left this toil worried and crushed and wanting to take breath there were still three rosaries to exhaust and as soon as he had stopped the question of the eucharist which had been dropped came up again better not to communicate than to communicate badly and it was impossible that after such debates and with such prejudices he could properly approach the holy table yes but then what shall i do in reality was it not monstrous of me to dispute the monk's orders to wish to carry them out in my own way to take them up at my convenience if this goes on i shall sin so much to-day that i shall have to confess again he said to break through this feeling he threw himself again upon his wheel but then stupefied himself completely the device he had tried to keep himself before the virgin at least was used up when he wished to abstract himself and to bring up a recollection of memling he could not succeed and his lip prayers wearying him distressed him my soul is worn out he thought i should do well to let it rest while i stay quiet he wandered round the pond not knowing what to do next suppose i go to my cell he went there tried to become absorbed in the little office of the virgin and did not grasp a single word of the phrases he was reading he went down and began to prowl about the park again this is enough to drive me mad he cried and mournfully he exclaimed i ought to be happy to pray in peace and prepare myself for to-morrow's act yet never have i been so restless so upset so far from god but i must finish this penance despair seized him and he was on the point of letting all go he mortified himself again and compelled himself to tell the beads he finished by dispatching them he was at the end of his powers and he immediately found a new means of torture he reproached himself with having moaned the prayers negligently without having even seriously tried to follow their meaning and he was on the point of beginning the rosary over again but in the face of the evident folly of this suggestion he pulled himself up refused to listen and then he worried himself again it is none the less true that you have not literally fulfilled the task assigned you by the confessor 
for your conscience reproaches you for your want of reflection and your wandering but i am half dead he exclaimed i cannot go through the exercises again in this condition and once again he ended by giving a casting vote and finding a new weakness by saying over another ten thoughtfully pronouncing the prayers with care he might make up for all the beads of the rosary which he had mumbled without understanding them and he tried to turn the crank but as soon as he had got out the pater he wandered he was obstinate in wishing to grind out the aves but then his mind gave way and became thoroughly distracted he stopped thinking what is the use of it besides would one set of ten however well said be equal to five hundred prayers that have missed fire and then why one set of ten and not two why not three it is absurd he grew angry after all he concluded these repetitions are absurd christ positively declared that we should not use vain repetitions in our prayers then what is the object of this wheel of aves if i dwell upon such ideas if i cavil at the injunctions of the monk i am lost said he suddenly and by an effort of will he stifled the revolt which was rumbling in him he took refuge in his cell the hours lengthened interminably he killed the time by recapitulating all the same objections with all the same answers it was a repetition of which he was himself ashamed so much is certain that i am the victim of an aberration he said i do not speak of the eucharist there my thoughts may not be exact but at least they are not maddening while as for this question of paternosters he confused himself so much that he felt hammered like an anvil between these two opposing ideas and finally sank drowsily on a chair thus he passed the time till the hour of vespers and supper after this meal he returned to the park and then the slumbering dispute revived and all came back a furious battle was raging within him he remained there immovable astounded listening to himself when a rapid footstep approached and monsieur bruno said to him take care you are possessed by the devil and as durtal stupefied did not answer yes he said god sometimes allows me intuitions and i am certain at this moment that the devil is working in you let us see what is wrong with you i i do not know myself and durtal told him of the extraordinary conflict about the rosary which had been raging in him since the morning but this is madness exclaimed the oblate it is ten beads the prior ordered you to tell ten rosaries would be impossible i know it and yet i doubt still always the same tactics said m bruno contriving to render disgusting the thing you ought to do yes the devil wished to make the rosary odious to you by crushing you with it and what is there besides you do not wish to communicate to-morrow true replied durtal i thought as much when i was watching you at supper ah well after conversions the evil one is at work and it is nothing believe me he was harder on me than that he slipped his arm under durtal's and leading him to the auditorium begged him to wait and disappeared some minutes afterwards the prior entered well said he monsieur bruno tells me you are suffering what is it exactly it is so stupid that i am ashamed to explain myself you will never astonish a monk said the prior smiling well i know precisely i am certain that you gave me ten beads of the rosary to recite every day for a month and since this morning i have been arguing with myself against all common sense to convince myself that my daily penance is to be the rosary ten times hand me your rosary said the monk and look at these ten beads well that is all i prescribed for you and all you have to recite so you have told all the beads ten times to-day durtal signified assent and naturally you were perplexed you lost all patience and ended up by rambling and seeing durtal's pitiful smile well listen to me declared the father in an energetic tone i absolutely forbid you for the future to begin a prayer again it has been badly said so much the worse go on do not repeat it i need not ask you if the idea of abstaining from communion occurred to you for that comes of itself it is there that the enemy directs all his efforts do not listen to the devil's voice which would keep you away whatever happens you will communicate to-morrow you should have no scruple for i command you to receive the sacrament i take it all upon myself and now another question what sort of nights have you durtal told him of the awful night of his arrival at la trappe and of the feeling of being spied upon which had awakened him the day before 
we have long known these manifestations they are without imminent danger do not therefore let them trouble you at the same time if they continue you will let me know and we will not neglect attending to them and the trappist left quietly while durtal remained thinking i never doubted that those phenomena were satanic he thought but i did not understand these attacks upon the soul this charge at full speed against my reason which remains untouched and yet is overcome that is remarkable if only this lesson may be useful to me so that i may not be unhorsed on the first alarm he went up to his cell again and a great peace fell upon him all had died down at the voice of the monk he now only felt surprise at having been off the rails for hours he understood now that he had been assailed unawares and that the struggle had not been with himself he said his prayers and lay down and suddenly the assault began again by new tactics he had not guessed at no doubt i shall communicate to-morrow he said to himself but but am i prepared for such an act i ought to have collected my thoughts in the daytime i ought to have thanked the lord for having absolved me and i have lost my time in nonsense why did i not say that just now to father maximin how is it that i did not think of it then i ought to have confessed again and this priest who will give me the communion this priest the horror which he felt for this man increased suddenly and became so vehement that he was astonished ah but there i am again knocked about by the enemy he said and he went on all that shall not prevent me from receiving the heavenly bread to-morrow for i have quite decided only how frightful it is that the spirit of malice should be allowed to oppress and harass me without respite while i have no sign from heaven which does not interfere and i know nothing ah lord if i were only certain this communion would please thee give me a sign show me that i may ally myself with thee without remorse let the impossible take place so that to-morrow it may be a monk and not this priest and he stopped himself astonished at his boldness asking himself how he dared ask for and indicate a sign it is idiotic he exclaimed in the first place no one has a right to claim such favours from god and then as he will not grant my prayer what shall i have gained i shall infer from the refusal that my communion will be worth nothing and he prayed the lord to forget his wish excused himself for having formed it and wished to convince himself that he should not take it into account and helped by the agitations of the day he ended by falling asleep as he prayed end of part two chapter three part two chapter four of en route by jory karl heismans translated by charles keegan paul this librivox recording is in the public domain when he left his cell he said to himself this morning i shall communicate and these words which should have thrilled him through and through woke no zeal in him he remained dull tired and caring for nothing feeling cold in the depth of his being nevertheless a fear stimulated him when he was outside i do not know he said to himself when i must leave my seat and go to kneel before the priest i know that the congregation should communicate after the celebrant but at what moment exactly ought i to move it is indeed another misfortune that i should have to go up alone towards this table which so disturbs me otherwise i shall only have to follow the others and at least be sure of not doing anything improperly he scrutinized the chapel as he went in looking round for monsieur bruno who had he been by his side might have kept off his scruples but the oblate could not be found durtal sat down disabled dreaming of the sign he had asked for the evening before endeavouring to throw off the recollection thinking of it all the same he wished to examine himself and collect himself and he was praying heaven to forgive him his mental vacillations when monsieur bruno came in and went to kneel before the statue of the virgin almost at the same minute a brother who had a beard like seaweed growing from a face like a pear took up to the altar of st joseph a small rustic table on which he placed a basin a towel two vases and a napkin before these preparations which recalled the imminence of the sacrifice durtal stiffened himself and succeeded by an effort in keeping back his anxieties and overthrowing his troubles and escaping from himself he ardently implored our lady to intervene so that he might for this hour at least without wandering pray in peace 
and when he had finished his prayer he lifted his eyes and looked with a start at the priest who was advancing preceded by a lay brother to celebrate mass this was not the curate whom he knew but another younger very tall with a majestic air with cheeks pale and shaven and a bald head durtal was watching him solemnly marching towards the altar with his eyes cast down when he suddenly noticed a violet flame light up his fingers he wears an episcopal ring he is a bishop thought durtal who leant forward to see the colour of the vestment underneath the chasuble and alb it was white then it is a monk he said astounded and mechanically he turned towards the statue of the virgin summoning the oblate by a hasty glance who came to sit beside him who is he dom Anselm, the abbot of the monastery he who was ill yes he will give us communion durtal fell upon his knees suffocated almost trembling he was not dreaming heaven was answering him by the sign on which he had fixed he ought to abase himself before god to be overwhelmed at his feet to spread himself in a passion of gratitude he knew and wished it and without knowing how he was exercising himself in seeking natural causes which might account for the substitution of a monk for the priest no doubt it was very simple for on the whole before admitting a kind of miracle anyhow i will keep an open mind for after the ceremony i wish to clear the matter up and he repelled the insinuations which crept into him well what interest could there be in the motive of this change there clearly must be a motive but it was only a consequence an accessory the important point was the supernatural will which had produced it in any case you have obtained more than you asked you have even a better than the simple monk you wished for for you have the abbot of la trappe himself and he cried oh to believe to believe like these poor lay brothers not to be endowed with a soul which is blown about by every wind to have the faith of a child an immovable faith a faith which cannot be rooted up ah oh, father father bury it rivet it in me and such was his enthusiasm that he came out of himself all around him seemed to disappear and he cried stammering to christ lord go not far from me let thy pity curb thy justice be unjust forgive me receive thy poor beadsman for communion the poor in spirit m bruno touched his arm and with a glance invited him to accompany him they went up to the altar and knelt upon the flagstones then when the priest had blessed them they knelt closer on the single step and the lay brother handed them a napkin for there was no bar or cloth and the abbot of la trappe gave them the communion they returned to their places durtal was in a state of absolute torpor the sacrament had in a manner anaesthetized his mind he fell on his knees at his bench incapable even of unravelling what might be moving within him unable to rally and pull himself together and all of a sudden the impression came over him that he was suffocating and wanted air the mass was finished he rushed out and ran to his walk there he wished to take an account of himself and he found nothing and in front of the cross pond in whose waters the christ was drowning there came over him an infinite melancholy a vast sadness it was a true syncope of the soul it lost consciousness and when it came to itself he was astonished that he had not felt an unknown transport of joy then he dwelt on a troublesome recollection on the all too human side of the deglutition of a god the host had stuck against his palate and he had had to seek it out with his tongue and roll it about like a pancake in order to swallow it ah it was still too material he only wanted a fluid a perfume a fire a breath and he tried to explain to himself the treatment that the saviour made him follow all his anticipations had returned it was the absolution and not the communion which had worked when with the confessor he had very clearly perceived the presence of the redeemer all his being had in a manner been injected with divine effluvia and the eucharist had only brought him suffocation and trouble it seemed that the effects of the two sacraments had changed places the one with the other they had worked the wrong way with him christ had been perceptible to his soul before and not afterwards but it is easy enough to see he reflected that the great question for me is to have an absolute certainty of my forgiveness by a special favour jesus has ratified my faith in the healing power of penance why should he have done more and then what bounties would he reserve for his saints 
after all i am astonishing it is too much that i should wish to be treated as he certainly treats brother anaclitus and brother simeon i have obtained more than i deserve and what an answer i had this very morning yes indeed but why should such advances end suddenly in this recoil and making his way towards the abbey to eat his bread and cheese he said to himself my error towards god is to be always arguing when i ought to adore stupidly as these monks here do ah to be able to keep silence silence to oneself that is indeed a grace he reached the refectory which as a rule he had to himself m bruno never coming to the meal at seven o'clock in the morning he was beginning to cut himself a piece of bread when the father guestmaster appeared he had a whetstone and some knives in his hand and smiling at durtal he said i am going to polish the knives of the monastery for they want it badly and he placed them on a table in a small room attached to the refectory well are you satisfied he said on coming back certainly but what happened this morning how is it i was communicated by the abbot of la trappe when i should have been by the curate who dines with me ah exclaimed the monk i was as much surprised as you on waking the father abbot suddenly declared that he must say mass this morning he got up in spite of the observations of the prior who as a doctor forbade him to leave his bed neither i nor any one else knows what took him and they told him that a retreatant would communicate and he answered just so i shall communicate him and then m bruno took the opportunity of also approaching the sacrament for he loves to receive our saviour from the hands of dom anselm and this arrangement also satisfied the curate the monk went on smiling for he left la trappe at an earlier hour this morning and has been able to say his mass in a parish where he was expected by the way he told me to make his excuses to you for not having been able to bid you good-bye durtal bowed there is no doubt about it he thought god wished to give me an unmistakable answer and your health it is good father i am astounded my digestion has never been so good as it is here to say nothing of the fact that the neuralgia which i feared so much has spared me that shows that heaven protects you yes indeed but now that i remember it i have long wished to ask you this how are your offices arranged they do not correspond with those printed in my prayer book no they differ from yours which belong to the roman ritual at the same time the vespers are almost similar except sometimes the lessons and then what may put you out is that ours are often preceded by the vespers of the blessed virgin as a general rule we have a psalm less in the office and the lessons are nearly always short except father Etienne went on smiling in compline the very one you recite thus you may have noticed we know nothing of in manus tuas domine which is one of the few short lessons sung in parish churches we also have a special proper of saints we celebrate the commemoration of the blessed of our order which you will not find in your books in fact we follow the letter of the monastic breviary of saint benedict durtal had finished his breakfast he rose fearing to trouble the father by his questions one word of the monk however was troubling his brain that relating to the prior as a doctor and before going out he spoke of this again to father Etienne. no the reverend father maximin is not a doctor but he understands simples very well and he has a small pharmacy which is enough as long as no one is seriously ill and in that case in that case the practitioner can be called in from one of the nearest towns but no one is ever so ill as that or else the end is approaching and the doctor's visit would be useless so on the whole the prior looks after soul and body at la trappe the monk signified assent durtal went out he hoped to get rid of his suffocation by a long walk he took a road which he had not been along before and came out on a glade where stood the ruins of an ancient convent some bits of wall truncated columns and capitals in the roman style unhappily these remains were in a deplorable condition rough covered with moss and riddled with holes like pumice stones he went on and came to the end of a long walk at the top of which was a pond five or six times as large as the small one in the form of a cross which he frequented the walk was planted with old oaks on each side and in the middle near a wooden bench stood a cast-iron statue of the virgin he groaned as he looked at it the crime of the church followed him once more 
even in this little chapel so full of divine compassion all the statues came from the religious bazaars of paris or lyon he took his position below near the pond whose banks were bordered by reeds surrounded by tufts of osiers and he amused himself by examining the colours of these shrubs with their smooth green leaves and stalks of citron yellow or blood red noticing the curling water which began to foam with a gust of wind and the martins skimmed it touching it with the tips of their wings from which drops of water fell like pearls of quicksilver and the birds rose whirling above and giving out their cries of wheat 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 while the dragonflies shone brightly in the air which they slashed with blue flames peaceful refuge thought durtal i ought to have come to rest here before he sat down on a bed of moss and interested himself in the noiseless and active life of the waters now the splash and flash of the turn of a leaping cup now great spiders skating on the surface making little circles and driving one against another stopping going back and making new rounds then near him on the ground durtal noticed jumping green grasshoppers with vermilion bellies or scaling the oaks colonies of queer insects on whose backs a devil's head was painted in red lead on a black ground and above all that if he raised his eyes there was the silent upturned sea of heaven a blue sea crested with surging white clouds like waves and at the same time this firmament moved in the water where it billowed under a bluish-grey glass durtal felt himself expand as he smoked cigarettes the melancholy which had oppressed him since the dawn began to melt away and joy crept into him as he felt his soul was washed in the pool of the sacraments and dried in the air of a cloister and he was at once happy and uneasy happy for the meeting he had had with the father guestmaster had removed all the doubts he had entertained as to the supernatural side to the sudden change of a priest for a monk to communicate him happy also to know that not only had christ not repulsed him in spite of all the disorders of his life but that he was encouraging him and giving him pledges ratifying the signs of his favours by perceptible acts and nevertheless he was uneasy for he knew himself to be barren and felt that it was necessary for him to be grateful for this goodness by a struggle with himself and an entirely new existence differing completely from that he had hitherto led well we shall see and he went off to the office of sext almost calmed and thence to dinner where he found monsieur bruno we will go for a walk to-day said the oblate rubbing his hands durtal looked at him with astonishment yes indeed i thought that after communion a little air outside the walls would do you good and i proposed to the reverend father abbot to free you from the rule for to-day if the offer is not disagreeable to you i gladly accept and thank you sincerely for your kind attention said durtal they dined off a soup made with oil in which a stick of cabbage and some peas were swimming it was not bad but the bread made at la trappe reminded him when stale of the bread in the siege of paris and made the soup turn sour then they tasted an egg with sorrel and some rice steeped in milk if it suits you said the oblate we will begin by paying a visit to dom anselm who has expressed a wish to know you and Monsieur Bruneau led Durtal through a labyrinth of passages and staircases to a small cell where the abbot was. He was dressed like the father's in a white robe and a black scapula. Only at the end of a violet cord he bore on his breast an abbot's cross of ivory, in the centre of which, under a round glass, some relics were inserted. He gave his hand to Durtal and begged him to sit down. Then he asked if the food seemed to be enough for him and on receiving a reply in the affirmative from durtal he inquired if the long silence did not weigh upon him too much not at all this solitude suits me perfectly well said the abbot laughing you are one of the few laymen who have borne our rule so easily generally those who have tried to make a retreat here have been devoured by homesickness and spleen and have had but one idea to get away let us see he said after a pause it is not possible all the same that such a sudden change of habits should not bring with it some painful privations there must be at least one which you feel above all the others true i feel the want of being able to light a cigarette whenever i like the abbot answered smiling but i suppose you have not been entirely without smoking since you came here i should tell a lie if i said i had not smoked in secret why bless me tobacco was not foreseen by saint benedict there is no mention of it in his rule and i am therefore free to allow its use 
so smoke as many cigarettes as you like without being uneasy and dom anselm added i hope shortly to have a little more time to myself unless indeed i am obliged to keep my room in that case i shall be happy to have a longer talk with you and the monk who seemed exhausted shook them by the hand going down into the court with the oblate durtal exclaimed the father abbot is charming and quite young he is hardly forty he appears to be really ill yes he is not well and he required no common energy to say his mass this morning but let us see we will first of all visit the grounds of la trappe which you can hardly have been over completely then we will leave the enclosure and push on to the farm they started skirting the remains of the ancient abbey and as they walked turning by the piece of water near which durtal had been seated in the morning m bruno entered into explanations about the ruins this monastery was founded in eleven twenty seven by saint bernard who installed the blessed Humbert as abbot an epileptic cistercian whom he had cured by a miracle at that time there were apparitions in the convent a legend relates that two angels came and cut one of the lilies planted in the cemetery every time one of the monks died the second abbot was the blessed Guéric, who was famous for his knowledge his humility and his patience in enduring evils we possess his relics and they are enclosed in the shrine under the high altar but the most remarkable of the superiors who succeeded each other here in the middle ages was peter monoculus whose story was written by his friend the member of the synod thomas de rhin pierre called monoculus or the one eye was a saint thirsting for austerities and sufferings he was assailed by horrible temptations at which he laughed exasperated the devil attacked his body and by fits of neuralgia broke his skull but heaven came to his aid and cured it by shedding tears from a spirit of penitence peter lost an eye and he thanked our lord for this blessing i had he said two enemies i have escaped the first but the one i retain troubles me more than the one i have lost he worked miracles of healing the king of france louis seven venerated him so much that on seeing the empty eyelid he wished to kiss it monoculus died in eleven eighty six they soaked linen cloths in his blood and washed his entrails in wine which was distributed for the mixture was a powerful remedy the property of the abbey was then immense it comprised all the country which surrounds us kept up several lazar houses in the neighbourhood and was the home of more than three hundred monks unfortunately what happened to others happened to notre dame de latre under the rule of abbots in commendam it declined and it was dying with only six religious to look after it when the revolution suppressed it the church was then pulled down and afterwards replaced by the rotunda chapel only in eighteen seventy five the present house which i think dates from seventeen thirty three was reconciled and became a monastery again trappists were brought here from saint marie de la mer in the diocese of toulouse and this small colony has made notre dame de latre the cistercian nursery you see such in few words is the history of the convent said the oblate as for the ruins they are buried underground and no doubt precious fragments might be discovered but for want of money and men no excavations have been made in addition to the broken columns and the capitals we passed there remains from the old church a large statue of the virgin which has been erected in one of the corridors of the abbey besides this there are two angels fairly well preserved and which you may see down there at the end of the cloister in a small chapel hidden behind a curtain of trees a virgin before which saint bernard may possibly have knelt ought surely to have been put in the church on the altar dedicated to mary for the coloured statue which surmounts it is of crying ugliness like that one also said durtal pointing out in the distance the cast-iron madonna which towered above the pond the oblate bowed his head and did not reply do you know exclaimed durtal who in the face of this silence did not persist and changed the conversation do you know that i envy you living here it is certain that i do not deserve this favour for on the whole the cloister is less an expiation than a reward it is the only place where far from the world and near heaven the only place where a man may give himself up to this mystic life which only develops in solitude and silence yes and if possible i envy you yet more that you should have had the courage to venture into regions which i confess frightened me and i know so well that in spite of the springboard of prayers and fasts in spite of the greenhouse or orchid house atmosphere wherein mysticism is grown i should wither away in these regions without ever expanding again the oblate smiled what do you know about it he replied the thing is not done in an hour the orchid you speak of does not flower in a day 
the advance is so slow that mortifications space themselves out fatigues are distributed over years and on the whole are easily borne as a general rule it is necessary to cross the distance which separates us from the creator to go through three grades to attain that science of christian perfection which is called mysticism we must live in turn the life of purification of illumination and of unity to join the uncreated good and be poured out in him it matters little that these three grand phases of ascetic existence subdivide themselves into an infinity of stages which are degrees according to saint bonaventure dwelling places according to saint teresa steps according to saint angela they may vary in length and number according to the will of the lord and the temperament of those who go through them it is not disputed that the journey of the soul towards god includes first perpendicular and breakneck roads these are the roads of the life of purification next narrower paths still but well marked out and accessible these are the paths of the life of illumination at length a wide road almost smooth the road of the life of unity at the end of which the soul throws itself into the furnace of love and falls into the abyss of the most adorable infinity on the whole these three ways are successively reserved to those who start in christian asceticism to those who practice it and finally to those who attain to the supreme end the death of self and the life in god long pursued the oblate i have placed my desires beyond the horizon yet i progress little i am scarcely disengaged from the life of purification scarcely and you do not fear how shall i say material infirmities for if at last you succeed in attaining the limits of contemplation you risk the ruin of your body for ever experience seems to show in effect that the deified soul acts on the constitution and brings incurable troubles the oblate smiled in the first place i should no doubt fail to attain to the last degree of initiation the extreme point of mysticism then supposing i attain it what would corporal accidents be in the face of such results let me also assure you that these accidents are neither so frequent nor so certain as you seem to think a man may be a great mystic or an admirable saint and not be the subject of visible phenomena for those who surround him would you not think for example that levitation or the flight of bodies in the air which seems to constitute the highest state of rapture is one of the rarest whom can you quote to me saint teresa saint christina the admirable saint peter of alcantara dominique of mary jesus agnes of bohemia margaret of the blessed sacrament the blessed gorardesca of pisa and above all saint joseph of cupertino who raised himself at will from the ground but they are ten or twenty out of thousands of the elect and note well that these gifts do not prove their superiority over other saints saint teresa declares expressly it must not be imagined that any one blessed as he may be in this respect is better than those who are not so blessed for our lord directs each one according to his particular need and then the doctrine of the church is seen in the untiring prudence shown in the canonization of the dead qualities and not extraordinary acts decide this for the church miracles themselves are only secondary proofs for she knows that the spirit of evil imitates them in the lives of the blessed you will find too the most unusual deeds and more amazing phenomena than in the biographies of the saints these phenomena have rather hindered than helped them after having beatified them for their virtues the church has put off and no doubt for a long time their promotion to the sovereign dignity of saints it is difficult on the whole to formulate an exact theory on this subject for if the cause if the mental action is the same in all mystics it differs a little as i have said according to god's will and the character of the subjects the difference of sex often changes the form of the mystic flow though in essence it never varies the rush of the spirit from on high may produce different effects but is none the less identical the only observation we dare make in these matters is that women as a rule are more passive and less reserved while men resist more violently the wishes of heaven that makes me think said durtal that even in religion there are souls which seem to have mistaken their sex saint francis of assisi who was all love had rather the feminine soul of a nun and saint teresa who was the most attentive of psychologists had the virile soul of a monk we might correctly speak of saint francis as a woman and saint teresa as a man the oblate smiled to return to your question he resumed i do not at all believe that illness can be the necessary consequence of phenomena aroused by the impetuous force of mysticism 
but look at saint colette lidwine saint aldegonde jane mary of the cross sister emmerich and how many more who pass their existence half paralyzed upon a bed they are a small minority besides the saints or blessed ones whose names you quote were victims of substitution expiating the sins of others a part god had reserved to them it is not therefore surprising that they were bedridden and cripples and were constantly half dead no the truth is that mysticism can modify the needs of the body without for all that having so much effect on or destroying the health i know well you would answer me with that terrible phrase of saint hildegard a phrase at once just and sinister the lord dwells not in the bodies of the healthy and vigorous and you might add with saint teresa that evils are more frequent in the last of the castles of the soul yes but these saints hoist themselves on the summit of life and retain god in a permanent manner in their carnal shell having reached this point nature too feeble to support a perfect state gives way but i assert again these cases are an exception and not a rule and alas such maladies are not contagious i am quite aware resumed the oblate after a pause that the very existence of mysticism is resolutely denied by some who in consequence can never admit the possibility of any influence over the bodily organs but the experience of this supernatural reality is from all time and proofs abound let us take the stomach for example well under the heavenly influence it becomes transformed omits all earthly nourishment and consumes the holy species only st catherine of siena and angelo of foligno lived for years exclusively on the sacrament and this gift devolved equally upon saint colette saint Lidwin, dominique of paradise saint columba of rieti mary bagnesi rose of lima saint peter of alcantara madronniers of Langeac, and on many others under the divine impress the senses of smell and taste presented no less strange metamorphoses saint philip neri saint angela saint margaret of cortona recognized a special taste in unleavened bread when after the consecration there was no longer any wheat but the very flesh of christ saint pacomius knew heretics by their foul smell saint catherine of siena saint joseph of cupertino and mother agnes of jesus discovered sins by their evil odours saint hilarion saint lutgard gentila of ravenna could tell merely by the scent of those whom they met what faults they had committed and the saints themselves whether living or dead exhaled powerful perfumes when saint francis de paul and venturini of bergamo offered the sacrifice they smelt sweet saint joseph of cupertino secreted such fragrant odours that his track could be followed and sometimes it was during illness that these aromas were diffused the pass of saint john of the cross and of the blessed didet gave forth strong and distinct scent of lilies bartol the tertiary gnawed to the bones by leprosy gave out pleasant emanations and the same was the case with lidwine ida of louvain saint colette saint humiliana maria victoria of genoa dominique of paradise whose wounds were boxes of perfume whence fresh scents escaped and thus we can enumerate organs and senses one after another and declare marvellous effects without speaking of those faithful stigmata which open or shut according to the proper of the liturgical year what is more astounding than the gift of bilocation the power of doubling oneself of being in two places at the same time at the same moment and yet what numerous examples exist of this incredible fact many are celebrated amongst others those of saint anthony of padua saint francis xavier marie of agreda who was at the same time in her monastery in spain and in mexico when she was preaching to infidels mother agnes of jesus who came to visit monsieur ollier at paris without leaving her convent at Langeac. and again the action from on high seems singularly energetic when it takes hold of the central organ of circulation the motor which drives the blood into all parts of the body numbers of the elect had such a burning heart that the linen they wore was singed the fire which consumed ursula ben in casa the foundress of the theatines was so strong that this saint breathed columns of smoke as soon as she opened her mouth saint catherine of genoa dipped her feet or her hands in iced water and the water boiled snow melted round saint peter of alcantara and one day when the blessed gerlach was crossing a forest in the depth of winter he advised his companion who walked behind him and who could not go on as his legs were numb to put his feet into his footsteps and immediately he ceased to feel cold i will add that certain of these phenomena which make freethinkers smile have been renewed and have been verified quite recently linen scorched by the fire of the heart has been observed by dr rimbert gourbert 
on the stigmatized palma doria and phenomena of high mysticism which no science can explain were watched in the case of louis lato minute by minute and noted and controlled by professor rolling dr la febre dr rimbert gourbert dr de Neuil, by medical delegates from all countries but here we are said the oblate excuse me i will go first to show you the way they had left the enclosure as he spoke and cutting across the fields reached an immense farm trappists bowed respectfully as they entered the courtyard Monsieur bruneau addressing himself to one of them asked him to be good enough to take them over the property the lay brother took them to the cattle sheds then to the stables then to the poultry yard durtal who was not interested in such sights confined himself to admiring the grace of these good people no one spoke but they replied to questions by signs and winks but how do they communicate with each other asked durtal when they were outside the farm you have just seen they correspond by signs they have a simpler alphabet than that of the deaf and dumb for each idea that they may require to express for their common work is foreseen thus the word wash is translated by one hand tapping on the other the word vegetable by scratching the left forefinger sleep is feigned by leaning the head upon the fist drink by raising a closed hand to the lips and for more spiritual expressions they employ a like method confession is translated by a finger kissed and laid upon the heart holy water by five fingers of the left hand clasped on which a cross is made with the thumb of the right hand fasting by fingers which close the mouth the word yesterday by turning the arm back towards the shoulder shame by covering the eyes with the hand but supposing they wished to indicate me who am not one of themselves how would they set about it they would use the sign of guest which they make by stretching out the hand and bringing it near the body that means that i come to them from far an open and even transparent fact if you like they went silently along a walk which led down into the labour fields i have not noticed brother anacletus or old simeon among these monks exclaimed durtal suddenly they are not occupied on the farm brother anacletus is employed in the chocolate factory and brother simeon looks after the pigs both are working in the immediate neighbourhood of the monastery if you like we will go and wish simeon good morning and the oblate added you can tell them when you go back to paris that you have seen a real saint such as existed in the eleventh century he carries us back to the time of st francis of assisi he is in some sense the reincarnation of that astonishing juniper whose innocent exploits the fioretti celebrate for us you know that work yes after the golden legend it is the book on which the soul of the middle ages is most clearly impressed but to return to simeon this old man is a saint of uncommon simplicity here is one proof out of a thousand several months ago i was in the prior's cell when brother simeon appeared he made use of the ordinary formula in asking permission to speak benedicite father maximin replied dominus and on this word which permitted him to speak the brother showed his glasses and said he could no longer see clearly that is not very surprising said the prior you have been using the same glasses for nearly ten years and since then your eyes may well have become weaker never mind we will find the number which suits your sight now as he spoke father maximin mechanically moved the glass of the spectacles between his hands and suddenly he laughed showing me his fingers which were black he turned round took a cloth cleaned the spectacles and replacing them on the brother's nose said to him do you see brother simeon and the old man astonished cried yes i see but this is only one side of this good man another is the love of his beasts when a sow is going to bring forth he asks permission to pass the night by her and delivers her looking after her like his child weeps when they sell his little pigs or when the big ones are sent to the slaughter-house and how all the animals adore him truly the oblate went on after a silence god loves simple souls above all for he loads brother simeon with graces alone here he can reabsorb and even prevent the demoniacal accidents which arise in cloisters then we assist at strange performances one fine morning all the pigs fall on their sides they are ill and at the point of death simeon who knows the origin of these evils cries to the devil wait wait and you will see he runs for holy water and sprinkles them with it praying the while and all the beasts who are dying jump up frisking about and wagging their tails as for diabolic incursions into the convent itself they are but too real and sometimes are only driven back after persistent prayers and energetic fastings 
at certain times in most convents the demon sows a harvest of hobgoblins of whom no one knows how to get rid here the father abbot the prior and all those who are priests have failed it was necessary to give efficacy to the exorcisms that the humble lay brother should intervene so to forestall new attacks he has obtained the right to wash the monastery with holy water and to use prayers whenever he thinks well to do so he has the power of feeling where the evil one is hidden and he follows him tracks him and finally casts him out here is the piggery continued m bruno showing a tumble-down old place in front of the left wing of the cloister surrounded by palisades and he added i warn you the old man grunts like a pig but he will not answer your questions except by signs but he can speak to his animals yes to them only the oblate opened a small door and the lay brother all bent lifted his head with difficulty good day brother said m bruno here is a gentleman who would like to see your pupils there was a grunt of joy on the lips of the old man he smiled and invited them by a sign to follow him he introduced them into a shed and durtal recoiled deafened by horrible cries suffocated by the pestilential heat of the liquid manure all the pigs jumped up behind their barrier and howled with joy at the sight of the brother peace peace said the old man in a gentle voice and lifting an arm over the paling he caressed the snouts which on smelling him were almost suffocated by grunting he drew durtal aside by the arm and making him lean over the trellis work showed him an enormous sow with a snub nose of english breed a monstrous animal surrounded by a company of sucking pigs which rushed as if mad at her teats yes my beauty go my beauty murmured the old man stroking her bristles with his hand and the sow looked at him with little languishing eyes and licked his fingers she ended by screaming abominably when he went away and brother simeon showed off other pupils pigs with ears like the mouth of a trumpet and corkscrew tails sows whose stomachs trailed and whose feet seemed hardly outside their bodies newborn pigs which sucked ravenously at the teats larger ones who delighted in chasing each other about and rolled in the mud snorting durtal complimented him on the beasts and the old man was jubilant wiping his face with his great hand then on the oblate inquiring about the litter of some sow he felt his fingers in a row replying to the observation that the animals were very greedy by stretching his arms to heaven showing the empty troughs lifting ends of wood tearing up tufts of grass which he carried to his lips grunting as if he had his muzzle full then he took them into the courtyard placed them against the wall opened a door beyond and hid himself a formidable boar passed like a water spout upset a wheelbarrow scattering everything around him with a noise like a shell bursting then he broke into a gallop all round the courtyard and ended by taking a header into a sea of liquid manure he wallowed turned head over heels kicked about with his four feet in the air and got up black and disgusting as the inside of a chimney after this he halted granted a cheerful note and wished to fawn on the monk who checked him with a gesture your boar is splendid said durtal and the lay brother looked on durtal with moist eyes as he rubbed his neck with his hand sighing that means they are going to kill him soon said the oblate and the old man acquiesced with a melancholy shake of his head they left him thanking him for his kindness when i think of how this being who is devoted to the lowest duties prays in church i long to kneel before him and like his pigs kiss his hands exclaimed durtal after a silence brother simeon is an angelic being replied the oblate he lives the unitive life his soul plunged drowned in the divine essence under a rough exterior an absolutely white soul a soul without sin lives in this poor body it is right that god should spoil him as i have told you he has given him all power over the demon and in certain cases he allows him also the power of healing by the imposition of hands he has renewed here the wonderful cures of the ancient saints they ceased speaking and warned by the bells which were ringing for vespers they moved towards the church and coming to himself again trying to recover durtal remained astounded monastic life retarded time how many weeks had he been at la trappe and how many days since he had approached the sacraments that was lost in the distance ah life was double in these cloisters and yet he was not tired of it he had bent himself easily to the hard rule and in spite of the scanty meals he felt no sick headaches or failing he had never felt so well but what remained was a feeling of stifling 
of restrained sighs this burning melancholy for hours and more than all this vague anxiety at listening again within himself and hearing united in his person the voices of this trinity god the devil and man this is not the peace of soul i dreamed of and it is even worse than at paris he said to himself recalling the maddening trial of the rosary and yet how can i explain it i am happy here all the same end of part two chapter four